Hi guys, welcome to this video and blog post. My name is Rick Bradbury. I work alongside Pixel Pro as a partner studio um, on their try before you buy scheme. Um, so you can come along to the studio, rent the studio, try a little bit of gear, give me a call, ask some questions um, before you commit to buying it. Um, so what we're going to be doing in, in this video and in this blog post is breaking down this image that we see here. So we'll break down the lighting that was used, lighting equipment, lighting modifiers, uh, and also um, the considerations when using those for this image, as well as the editing Lightroom, and uh, we'll break it down further in the blog post below. So let's take a look at that. We'll go off full screen. Now, that is the final image um, that was originally edited back in 2018. Um, that's the raw file, so you've got the PSD file there, uh, which has gone round trip, Lightroom, Photoshop, the original raw file, and I have reset the raw file as well, um, so we can start from the original color image. Before we get to the edit, I'd like to just discuss how this was lit and the equipment used. So if we jump over to this image here, we'll make that full screen by pressing F, and we can see that we have a behind the scenes shot. Now, what I've done so we can see what's going on here, I've raised the exposure, lifted the shadows a little bit, just so we can see a bit more of the equipment, because anything that's not lit in this kind of a scenario, so all of the shadow areas back here, they will just be completely black and we're not gonna see anything. Now, the equipment that we have here um, from Pixar Pro is, Pixar Pro strip boxes, uh, 35 centimeter by 160 centimeters with the egg crate grids fitted. Um, see them there. They were both mounted to Storm 2400 units. They're monoblock or studio heads, mains powered. Um, see one just there. If we punch in, whoop, there it is. You can just about make the name out in the shadows. There we are. Uh, and then we have actually a fill light. Now that may surprise you, but this is the fill. Um, which was made up of a couple of Pika 200 units fitted to the dual bracket with a 7-inch reflector and a 20-degree grid. Um, so, to make it a little easier for you to find the equipment that was used, I will link it in the blog post below, of course, and in the description for the video. Um, but also, we'll have a quick jump over to the browser here. So, the studio units that we used, or studio lights, are the Storm 2 400s that we can see here, currently on sale at 375 a unit. Cracking lights, very, very short or fast flash durations for freezing action. Not that it was needed in this shot, granted, um, but cracking units. I've got two of the 400s, two of the 600s, love them, absolute workhorses. Um, the strip boxes that we can see here, now these aren't the easy open variants, there are options for easy open umbrella types. Um, which they have um, in their equipment stock. Um, but these are the rod speed rings and they basically stay put together and live at the studio. Uh, they come with a grid and there was two of these used, uh, which I'll explain how they were used when we jump back into Lightroom. Uh, the Pika 200s that we see here um, are two units. This was actually bought as a kit with the dual bracket here which will take the two units. It can either take a single bulb and just use one unit or two bulbs. So you go from 200 watt seconds to a 400 watt second light and it includes LED lamps there. Um, great bit of kit. I use it all the time, even in the studio when I've got mains power because it's just so handy to pick it up and go without worrying about tripping over a cable. Uh, now the modifier for that light, again, that was the fill was a 55 degree or seven inch reflector here, which is designed actually for the Storm units, Limo or Kino units um, with their grids. And I actually use the 20 degree grid that we can see there. So you've got the 10, 20, 30 and 40. I do tend to favor the 20, I really like that degree. The 10 can sometimes be a little bit too tight and a bit too wide um, on the 30 and 40, although they do come in use now and again. Now, trigger-wise, um, on my Canon 5D Mark II, I had the Pro ST4 trigger um, for Canon. There's various options there. Nikon, Sony, Olympus, Panasonic, Fuji, Pentax. Um, and it's a great trigger. Easy to change the power on the lights and see what you're doing with the large display. So that's a breakdown of the gear. So we'll flip back to Lightroom and we'll go back into this behind the scenes shot here just to explain what each light is. Um, thumbs up for the yellow director's chair. Surprisingly comfy. Anyway, 
Now, the key light is actually this unit here on the right. So this Storm 2 400 with the strip box and grid is the key, um, which is edging out this side here, down the side here, top of the leg and shoes, down to there. There's no light from that really hitting the background. You can see a little bit hitting the edge of the paper, um, but nothing's getting to the background. Any spill that you see on the background is actually from that grid or the edge of it. Now this strip box here is actually a hair light or kicker, if you will, or rim or separation. Um, so it just edges out here. It will hit a little bit of the side of the face depending on how far Rob turns his face or whether I direct him to do that, um, but that's fine. That's on a little bit lower of a power just to edge that side out. Now we have a Pixapro C stand here with a 50 inch boom arm holding the Pika 200s reflector and grid. So we'll go back whoop, into Lightroom and here, and we can see I actually converted a behind the scenes shot into black and white. So just to give you an idea on the exposure values that we see in the shadows, obviously if I hadn't lifted the exposure, we'd just see nothing back there. Uh, but I quite liked that as a behind the scenes shot as a graphic. There we go, uh, each to their own. So we'll show you how we edited this in a moment in Lightroom, that's the final shot. And we will also, before we do that, if we kick over to this image here, now what we can see is a little bit of a cameo from the strip box just about there. Um, that's just a modeling light, that light didn't fire. We can see that the edge and rim light here is lower in exposure than the key, which is off at the moment. Um, here, the grid fill is just about on just a little bit i just varied the power on that until i lit it to taste um, so we have that shot there and then we have uh, where are we let's bring that one up um, the key lights now that's a little bit darker than the final shot once i've got all the lights balanced and set uh, but it just gives an idea of with the key lights with a little bit of a push in from the grid spot fill here because this would all be in shadow um, if that wasn't there um, it just helps to lift that area of the face um, but this is the key light where we can see it catch light in the eyes just there which creates a very slim catch light with it being a strip box depends how you turn the strip box to be honest with you and orientate it because you can turn it horizontal vertical or in between and it just edges this side down here um, his jacket is leather or leather-esque um, so it has a natural sheen to it. So I'm not worried about black jacket on a dark background um, because naturally we're going to see a highlight on that material. So it's not a problem. Now, um, if you're looking at Lightroom here and think, wow, you've got the text really big, that's so you can see this easier and see the sliders once I want to start working on the image. Uh, so what we will do is we will drop down to edit the uh, reset raw file. Now, if we get rid of those there, just so we can see this a bit easier, we'll jump into develop, there we go, and we'll start getting to work on this. Now, as you can see, the key light on this side, lights all the way down here, this side of his face is the predominant key light. Um, you could call it kind of a short lit because the side which is away from camera is lit more dominantly than anywhere else, so if we were more dominant on exposure on this side here, be broad lit, facing towards the camera, um, but it just edges out that side of the face. The jacket picks up the highlight nicely. The background hasn't gone completely black because we're letting a little bit spill past the grid, that 20 degree grid. So when it hits here, a little bit of fall off will just hit down here. And we may get a little bit of spill at the lower section from the strip box um, also, which is the key light. Now we can all actually see the key light there making a bit of a cameo appearance, but that's easy enough to get rid of both in Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, so we have the rim and kicker down this side. Oh, there we go. The other one's trying to make an appearance in the corner. Watch the edges. Yeah. Right, and we've got the fill light, which is just filling in the shadows on this side or area of the face there. And then the key there, three lights, uh, nice and simple. So first thing I'm going to do is get it off Adobe Color and go to Adobe Standard. You can see you get a little bit more latitude in the file straight away. Um, Adobe Color, don't like it, it tends to crush the blacks, especially on the newer cameras. 
um, that we have today is in my opinion a bad profile there we go so if I bring up the information we can see that this was shot on a 5d mark II, uh, my workhorse camera um, the 85 1.4 L and at 160th of a second 5.6 ISO 160 there we go uh, I do tend to shoot with this camera on ISO 160 because it's a little cleaner if you do want to push the shadows there we go right so as we'll go down here let's I always tend to start on a medium contrast curve and uh, so we'll see that change from linear to medium contrast curves it's closer to the preview that I would see on the back of the camera generally speaking um, so I tend to start there noise reduction is off lens profiles on cool right so to start work on this image I think the first thing that we can do is get rid of the intruding light modifiers and um, they always want to be in the shot I tend to work them in as close as I can and um, without them hopefully being in the shot but it doesn't always go that way so what we'll do we'll just select that and Lightroom will automatically select an area and that's that gone in fact we'll do the other corner as well there we go now I could crop those out or crop part of one of them out but I tend to prefer to frame in camera my sensor is my canvas uh, sometimes to a fault but there we go and what we will do if we go poor man's black and white and just hit black and white there it's not too bad it's pretty close to where we got it to now you can leave it there of course um, you could of course take the saturation and go well, all the way down mm, a little bit muddy doing that so there we go and uh, what we'll do we'll go for black and white um, to begin with there and first thing I do is I look at the white balance now you might wonder well what are you looking at the white balance for it's going to black and white true um, my studio lights tend to live around the 5400 5450 Kelvin mark as a starting point um, in most cases and it's usually fairly bob on color wise um, but for black and whites I do tend to punch up towards about 6000 Kelvin um, which if we go back to color just looks super warm and yeah, horrible there we go and then we'll go for tint and we can start to see it have an effect on areas of the skin as we do that so it does make a difference certainly um, obviously that just kind of flattens it out if we go into the green away from the magenta it just adds a little bit more bite and we will actually work on the black and white HSL sliders shortly now exposure wise I'm really happy with this um, I don't tend to touch exposure a whole lot unless I've missed the ball um, but I'm absolutely fine with that if we hit J in Lightroom I'm not clipping on any highlights I don't care about the shadow areas blocking up here um, it's a high contrast scene the light is behind coming this way over to the side coming this way with the grid spot here so there's nothing happening down here likewise really so totally expecting that I do not mind the shadow area down here is not important and um, so that does not bother me whatsoever and uh, so what we will do rather than go for a global contrast we will whoops go for a little bit more of a curve there I like contrast in the black and white so I like it to have a little bit of bite um, if we have a look at the skin tones on the arm or the hand eh, starting to lose a little bit so I might just pull that back just a touch and see whether that ekes it back we'll do a global highlight there we've got detail back now if you're looking at the picture on a whole it may look a bit bright but it's fine there's detail within there it's the back of the hand so flatter towards the light source the key which is over here so we expect it to go brighter especially if it's a Caucasian skin color so what we'll do is I may pump the shadows just a little bit now you may process this differently depending on where it's going to go if you put things on Facebook it just hates blacks and crushes them and um, so you might process it a little differently I tend not to really process for individual galleries websites and what have you or social media platforms because life's just too short um, so take the blacks down a little bit um, 
Now for the black and white mixer, which is where we're going to do the majority of the work here. Uh, let's see, we'll go red channel. If we go too far with this, you see the red pigments in the skin. That just looks horrible. Um, the lips in particular go very, very bright. Um, so I don't really want to go that way with them. Orange, we'll start to see the majority of the skin change here. Um, pull this back too far, doesn't work at all. Now you may have a bit more latitude in certain RAW files versus old cameras like mine, but um, you do have to tend to be very careful on the red and orange channel. Um, on digital, we'll just take that back a little bit. Yellow, again, we'll start to see that. It depends on the skin of the person uh, color of the hair as well. If they had light blonde hair, we'd see a lot being ha a lot happening here on the yellow. Uh, pull that down a little bit. Green. And what I tend to do when I start to get to green and blues for black and white, I'm looking at the eyes and see what's happening there. Now, the eyes in this portrait aren't necessarily that prominent when you look at the image as a, as a whole. So if we zoom out, um, you can't really tell if you've messed with the eyes or not. To be honest with you. But I tend not to do a ton of work on the eyes because, in my opinion, if you've got light in the eyes, your job's done. You don't need to go in there with a brush. You don't need to replace eyeballs. There we go. So I think it's going to be blue, possibly. A mm, little hint of maybe on there. Now, let's see. Purple and magenta, I'm not going to need to do anything with. Skin tones are looking good. Eyes, lips and the hands, happy happy enough with the exposure there, that's fine. Um, I tend not to do any kind of split toning. So for example, if you were to try and warm something up, it starts to go sepia, which uh, no, never works. Um, so we'll do that, get rid of that one. Noise reduction, it's an ISO 160 file. I do not need to bother with that. It is absolutely fine. Darks, let's see what we've got here. May just balance this out a little bit. Oops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. And let's go into global contrast. Now, I'm not gonna to need to do a lot here. Now, obviously, if I take contrast out, it just goes really flat and we can see everything. Um, if I go all the way up, there's just too much contrast. Because of the way that this has been lit, there's already a lot of natural contrast in the scene. Um, so I don't really need to do a whole lot with that. There, and I tend to prefer to go on the curves, um, the individual shadow highlights and blacks, darks and lights first, versus global contrast. You can get away with doing it, but I prefer doing this the other way. Now, if I go back a tenth of a stop on the exposure, uh, yeah, it brings it back in line a little bit. Like I say, minor, minor change there. Um, histogram is as expected. There's a lot of shadow information here. And it goes through the mid-tones and then off to the highlights. Um, I do not want to get it to the point where, on the highlights, we are nudging the edge. Because you might think, well, I've got a full histogram there and it's not peaking, so it must be right. <laughs> Look at that. It's a mess. Um, so you've got to take into account the scene that you're shooting as well and how it's being lit. If there's a lot of natural contrast in there, it's totally fine and expected, take that one back, um, to have a lot of information bunched up in the shadow and black side here um, of the histogram. Um, now, you can of course push shadows if you wish to bring more of that back, um, which you can of course do, um, but it starts to go a little bit, a little bit muddy uh, whilst you gain information here, it starts to get a little bit muddy in areas like here and here. So I tend not to go too far with that. You can, of course, dodge and burn if you wish locally, uh, and that will do quite a lot there. Now, what I would normally do um, is round trip into Photoshop and then back into Lightroom. Um, should we do it? Tell you what, go on, let's do it. Right, so we'll go edit in Photoshop. Now these would obviously be very, very quick changes normally um, because there's not a lot of work that's done on the file. It's all caught in camera, which is I'm not, it's not something to preach. Um, you can shoot for the edit later or you can shoot to capture most of it in camera um, for minor adjustments later on. There's many different ways of working and both are totally fine. 
you know, obviously if you're a digital artist and you do a lot of compositing work, it's going to be more heavy on the post-production for you and you would shoot accordingly for that. So into Photoshop, um, what we'll do is we'll punch in, like I say, shot on a 5D Mark II, 21 megapixels, plenty of resolution. And what we will do is just get rid of that little skin fleck there. Don't really need to do a lot. I do not bother with frequency separation. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not a fan. Um, and most people are fine as they are. Yes, get rid of some blemishes, but don't make them look like a mannequin, please. And there we go. That's all fine. Not a lot needs doing there. I'll do a little bit of local sharpening um, around the lips, or in Rob's case, because he's got a cool beard. Um, we'll do some of the beard area as well. And it'll just add a little bit more bite to that area, especially where the highlights or the lights has hit the hairs. Um, again, it doesn't need to be a lot. Um, I will normally go over the eyes um, a little bit. We've not got much of a catch light in his right eye. Um, it's more predominantly to the left, totally expected. Um, as we see, his chin's down and he's turned slightly away from the grid, more towards the key. So totally expected with that. And what I'll do also is do a sharpen on sharp mask. I'm not particularly worried about the sharpness of the image, but just adds a little bit more to it. And then back into Lightroom. I suppose I could speed this bit up, wouldn't I? Probably will. <laughs> Come on. Right, so we'll close out of that. We'll jump back into Lightroom. And let's go back into there. So that's the PSD that we've just created in Photoshop, which I'd normally put onto a green label, but that's just going to confuse me. Um, and we will go into here, into develop, and I will tend to, I do have presets for this, but uh, we'll go and do just a little bit of final sharpening with a mask um, in Lightroom. Again, don't want it to have too much bite. The 5D Mark II with that lens is plenty sharp enough as it is. And we will do a little bit of texture, dehaze, I don't really think it needs, but we'll do just a tad, tad clarity. And uh, yeah, that's fine, there we go. And that is the final image. Now, if I um, go larger screen for you, and lights out, um, what we'll do, make it a green, medium gray background, a little bit easier for you to see, because if we make it full screen, it just bleeds off into the edges. And that is the final shot. Pretty close, I would say, to, oops, lights on please. Right, and we'll go down the size of the grid. Uh, let's see, where are we? If we compare those two there, Pretty close. That's the one we've just done, by the way. Uh, and that's that one. I'll probably drop the exposure just a touch more in the highlights than I did originally. Um, again, it's hindsight going back to a file. Um, you can often see things that you might want to change or your taste has changed in time. Um, but very, very similar there. There we go. So that is how we ended up with that as a final image. Okay, thank you very much for watching guys. Um, like I say, hopefully I've not witted on too long. Um, do check out the blog post below um, for a bit more information. We'll do links to the gear that was used, a bit more of a breakdown about that gear um, as well. Um, links will be in the description of the video on YouTube. Any questions, hit me up in the comments, send me a DM, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much guys, and I will see you soon.